We're in Ottawa with Louisa mm -hmm. von Flotto. How do I pronounce that for real? Exactly right. Louisa yeah. von Flotto in German. In German, it's a Flotto? Mm -hmm. Von Flotto. Von Flotto. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Louisa, what do you do here in Ottawa? I'm a professor for translation, translation studies. I train, on the one hand, undergraduate students who are becoming translators of uh, French working into English. Mm -hmm. And I do. Oh, no, you're German then. Yeah, but I'm but Canadian. You work... ah, so you, <laughs> I was you born in Canada. So, Canada. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My parents are German immigrants yeah. to Canada. And I was born shortly after they arrived, therefore, raised in German. Mm -hmm. until I turned five years old, went to school, and I learned English in school very quickly yeah. because I was very aware, made very aware of being different and of not mm -hmm. speaking properly and so, yeah. yeah. And, and then you English had French as well? French English. came later on at school, okay. yeah. But you're teaching between French and English? English, now. yeah. And not German? No, no, we okay. don't use, nobody trains anybody in German translation in North America, I could probably say. Maybe there's a little bit in California. Does some, yeah. Maybe. Every yeah. second year in mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. But German, most Germans uh, that you need to have contact with have excellent English or have their, their version of excellent English. And uh, so, no. So, Lucy, you've been in charge of the translation school here mm -hmm. in Ottawa. Yeah, I was the director of the school for mm -hmm. 10 years. And now I'm looking after only graduate studies. So, seeing who gets yeah. who gets admitted. What kind of? Do examined. you have any orientations in graduate studies? The school generally. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> do you have things that you're interested in or less interested in? Or? No, we we take students in, depending on how how coherent their proposal is, how what their background is, and how likely it looks that they can start a PhD and also finish it, um, which you could never really tell. Mm. And also, sometimes, depending on if there's someone who can supervise them, yeah. depending on what their proposal is. But often, if the proposal is really good and there's no one that can supervise them, we suggest somebody who supervises one aspect of it, and we bring in people from mm -hmm. outside. Yeah. So we've had people from China co-supervising. We've had people from California co-supervising, yeah. from New York, from Europe, depending. Lucy, so you're known as one of the main thinkers in feminist <laughs> gender yeah. Good. translation <laughs> studies yeah. uh, because of a book yeah. we did years ago. I edited yeah, it, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Okay. That was, that was the most that important was a long time ago, little it? book, 1997. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It gets yeah. cited. Yeah, uh, it's up there. <laughs> 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 How, and has that area developed happily, do you think? No. In translation <clears throat> well, it keeps, I keep pushing it. Mm -hmm. I think if... With I you think, and Sherry Simon, yeah. the two books came out yeah. very close to each other. Sherry Simon yeah. published one in 96, and then mine came out in 97. Um, Sherry, when she saw mine, she said, oh, we could have written, we should have written a book together. Well, uh, but Sherry doesn't yeah. write books together. No. No. And um, so, but it didn't matter. It was really, they were two quite different books. And then nothing came out. Nothing. Absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. And I've written about that. And I will continue to work on that. And now I put, I put out another book um, in an above edited collection of articles in 2011 mm -hmm. saying it's time to talk about women again. Mm -hmm. Because there, the, there was a huge hiatus in terms of feminism being legitimate or being viewed as legitimate or view, being viewed even as very vaguely interesting due to, in my view, gender taking over mm -hmm. and queer uh, taking yes, over yes. and pushing anything that had to do with women really to the side. And, mm -hmm. and um, a few people so have you're, you're commented re you're on that. So you're resisting that. Yeah, yeah. I'm s I think resistance. it's important to think about the fact that there are that 50% of most populations are is female, of which perhaps 10%, maybe 15 or maybe 12, I don't know, is other than heterosexual or other than what you would call cisgender now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that other huge uh, number of women is facing exactly the same issues that women have always faced. And the queer aspect 
of academia and queer aspect of, of other discourses really hasn't had any effect on them, okay. on their lives, on their, on their status, I don't think. And I think it needs to be constantly worked on. It need, people need to be reminded. Right. What about the connection between feminism and translation or translation studies? Mm -hmm. um, is it just, or is it the fact that some tra most translators are women? Or is it the translation of women's texts? Or, mm. or is there some more profound connection? Uh, it's probably, I don't know if it's more profound, oh, but okay. it's... Um, well, Jean Delille would, would say, you know, uh, subordination of the translator is considered subordinate and therefore there's a natural connection. But, yeah. But I, yeah. I don't know if you... Well, but, there's one really famous essay that everyone cites on that topic, and yeah. that is um, uh, hmm, Metaphorics of Gender. Uh, <laughs> um, Sherry? No, Laurie yeah. Chamberlain. Laurie Chamberlain, yes, yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, who shows again yeah. and again how in British... Uh, and maybe with reference also to French, Les Belles Infidèles, yeah. there's always this kind of connection between sexuality, especially women's untrustworthy and to be controlled sexuality, yeah. so that we can ensure that the paternity of the offspring, whether it be a child or a, or a text, is proper. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so there's that. Well, that's in translation theory. That's in, in translation European theory. Translation theory yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. And that is something that's been repeated again and again and again in, yeah. in various ugly terms, also relatively recently by um, someone who's referred to translation as raping a text, mm -hmm. taking a text over by raping so it. So how do you feel about that? Or, or uh, translation is violence? I don't think I translation is violence, but Thank you. I know it's, a, it's, it's not rape, something right. people talk yeah. about, but yeah. No, the, when it's raping a text, it means appropriating it, taking it. Yours. No, but rape like a happens, real guy. and rape is a serious thing, it's <laughs> yeah. serious violence. So yeah. Don't, yeah. Okay. yeah, I don't think, I, I know that some people talk about translation as doing violence to a text. I think if we don't translate, we don't have access to that material. I couldn't read Tolstoy if they didn't trans if it weren't translated. I couldn't read, read a zillion books if they weren't translated. Mm, I, I think it's... Okay. I think it's an exaggeration. So, generally, you're not happy with the development of feminist translation studies? You think no, it's, it, it more has to be done? Yeah, I, I think yeah. feminist work in feminism and, can, and the link between feminism and translation studies kind of petered out and or was pushed aside, and then it also became um, uh, tricky to talk about feminism even, or to, to insist on because feminism. Because of the queer. Yeah, because of the queer that. and the... And, and, and issues of masculinity. I mean, everybody started, you know, wondering how the poor men are doing, you know, in, in the <laughs> in the face of these aggressive feminists. Oh, <laughs> come on, that was not true. Masculinity <laughs> studies, the poor guys that are trained to be men. I mean, true Yeah, work, okay, true. You know, we had to I learn agree. how to live with women. Yes, it's fair. <laughs> Hold on, serious question. Where, when you were 23, 24, where yeah. were you? 23, 24, I was uh, living in Germany, and I had two little children. Really? And I was married to a British a Londoner, and I was teaching English occasionally in evening classes in the Volkshochschule, also Ooh. French, and with my two little kids in tow. Well, they didn't come to the Volkshochschule, but they, they I had two babies. Were you translating or teaching translation? No, Not no I was teaching language. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, uh, but then uh, I, when I was, let's say, 26, 27, we moved back. We moved to Canada. I was originally from Canada mm -hmm. and my British husband immigrated to Canada mm -hmm. and then two more children were born and that's when I started translating. That's when I realized that there was an MA in French close by in a small Canadian university with a professor who was interested in translation and who would train, do give classes in translation. And I did my MA with him mm. and it, they were in literary translation. Okay. And here in Canada at that time, there was a big um, surge of writing from French Canada mm. that was okay. being translated into English. So what does okay. Quebec want was one of the big questions, right? Um, so you were translating? Quebec women. Writers into <clears throat> English, into English from French into English. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and that's really what what pushed uh, me into the direction of feminist, 
So what, what years would they? What, what that would have been eighty. Okay. From the early eighties on. Because then when I met you, you were, you were living in Europe, so you yeah. went back to Europe. Back to Europe after, after that. that, yeah. Right. Back and forth. I'm mm. I'm a real typical immigrant kid, mm. and the oldest of the first of the family of immigrant kids, and so I got the full full whack of of German culture that my younger brothers and sisters uh, didn't and or got less of and so I always tried to go back to Europe. Europe. I also found Canada really quite boring. Really mm. boring. Oh hold on, you live in Ottawa. No. <laughs> At oh, the okay. time no. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, mm. and you grow up with two cultures and two languages and you easily take get a third one and I was interested in Russian and I'd studied Latin. There was nothing for me in Canada okay. in in the early 70s, nothing, zero. So, so you, you did a PhD along the line? Yeah, so later on with the kids in town. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. where was that? Michigan, University of Michigan, wow. Ann Arbor. Oh mm-hmm. man, so you've been, you four kids then. <laughs> <laughs> I left okay. them in Windsor and I, I left them in Canada, I crossed the border All every right. day. Yeah, you but, could do that, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, and then drove 70 kilometers to the university. And well, what was the PhD on? The PhD was for me was basically a vacation, from being a f- mother of four children. Right. It was a total. Was that its its title? Total vacation. <laughs> That's my vacation from my kids. <laughs> was it on translation then? Or, or uh, no, uh, they had no. There was no PhD in translation. I don't think anywhere in the U.S. That's right. Or Canada. Until Binghamton. Yeah. yeah. At that time, no. I I did I did a PhD in French literature. Mm. I decided that I was going to be living in Canada, and it was no point doing a PhD in German literature or history or anything, which I would also have been interesting. But so I did French, and I did what they call a sub a sub qualification or a sub exam or something like that in translation theory, mm, okay. and that's so a French French literature, women's writing, a dissertation on Quebec women's writing as an avant-garde, um, mm-hmm. you know, and their, their kind of aspiration to being avant-gardist, and then um, a subfield specialization in translation theory. Hmm. That okay. was good, okay. because it made me read Benjamin and... Uh, so that was before or after going in Europe and... That yeah, was that, was, then, that was, so University of London I did in Europe from 1970 to 75, and then... Uh, three years living in Germany, a young mom, right. and then another three or four years young mom, living in Canada, and then MA, 81 to 85, and then PhD, 85 to 91, okay. and then living back in Germany again for years. Glad you've got it all mapped out. Yeah, I've got it full. <laughs> Man, that was, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now here, I came here then from Germany uh, in 95. And I've been here ever since. Okay. And it's a, it's been a, it was a really good decision. Yeah. Really good decision. Yeah. Because of. Because um, this is a school of translation, not a de- translation section in a French department, mm-hmm. which you often have in Canada. Mm-hmm. It's got a, a reputation. It was established in 71, 1971. and so it has a strong reputation. It had a strong body of professors at the mm-hmm. time when I came. And it still does. Still does, okay. yeah. And so uh, it's it, it's in a place that takes translation seriously as a discipline. Mm. Yeah. And our students go to work uh, two doors down in the federal government. So, right. okay. you know, we can actually yeah. see yeah. where our students go, yeah. at least the undergrads. Yeah. And now, over the past six, seven years or so, we've had huge numbers of PH, PhD students arrive. Mm. Mm. International, really, yeah. really interesting people. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's been a, a really nice okay. development. Last question, Elisa. Mm-hmm. What kind of research do you think we need? Mm-hmm. Or what do you say for the students who come in and they're looking for a topic? Mm-hmm. What do we need? I think that one of the things that w- would be very good everywhere to do research on is on news translation, on translation in the media, mm-hmm. on translation in many different kinds of media, not just the what you see on the television, um, mm. but what are the questions? The questions for me are always the same ones. Who pays? Yeah. Who pays the translation uh, for the translation? 
Therefore, does the translation always work for the piper who, who calls the tune? Does the translator, mm. where are the, where are the, where are the effects of translation visible? What does the translator do as a mediator or as a, uh, as a trader, whichever way you want to look at it? And what are the effects of translation? That sounds very pessimistic. <laughs> yes. But I forgot, I forgot yeah. this as a radical, <clears throat> last time I was here, you brought out a book on Bader Meinhof. And, yes, you know, it's, you've it's got coming this out in French now. <laughs> streak there. You, you don't <laughs> want to see the translator as... No. As obeying economic imperatives. No, you, but I think yeah. the more you know, I, I notice it especially when um, there has been a certain amount of a certain amount of, of discussion recently, recently over the past ten years or so, about ethics in mm -hmm. translation. And I think that there is this huge discourse about the, uh, the 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 kind of illusion of translation being able to reproduce what the text says. And that, in fact, it's the job of the translator to reproduce what the text says. And I think in translation studies, we see again and again and again that the translator either cannot or does not or does not want to always reproduce what the text says, depending on the situation and the context, mm -hmm. on who's paying the bills and who is uh, hiring the translator and what the purpose of the translation is, we know that the translations very often deviate, not only in content, but in tone and in, in length and in, 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 in message, yeah. period, um, so that this notion of ethics that gets sometimes, that people sometimes pound you with, is like being pounded by religious dogma. <laughs> I don't think too I, idealistic. Too think. idealistic, okay. delusional. Okay. <laughs> On that happy note, <laughs> thank you, thank you very yeah, much. Please. I love finding those those <laughs> delusions and and writing about them and looking at them. And I think feminist translation has p pointed in that direction. I mean, it is deliberately mistranslation yes. sometimes. Yes, okay, so that, that was a, a liberation, in fact, mm -hmm. is justifying changing yeah. the text. And, yes. Uh, yes, and actually pointing to it and saying, watch said, me. We're going to do this for this reason, yeah. but the Soviet <laughs> Union had been doing it forever. That's and right, for, uh, that's right, and Bible and, translators have yes. been doing it forever. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, okay. all kinds of people have been doing it forever, but but in, in at least in feminist translation, they tend to or tended to and still I think do write about how they change the text in order to fit their politics. <laughs> Hasn't okay. changed. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. All right. Yeah.